Namaste. My name is Henry Jericao, and this is part two on a series of videos on self-inquiry. I am giving commentaries on a video that I filmed in 2014 with David Godman. That video has now been seen more than 400,000 times and there's a link under this video to see that very important video if you have not seen it. In part number one, I say that it is better to focus on the right side of the heart. There's been so many discoveries since the time of Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharishi about the power, the blessing, the healing of focusing one's attention on the art area. David Godman argued in that video that we should only deal with asking the question who am I? And we should not focus on the right hand side of the heart as recommended by Arthur Osborne. Bringing the attention to the heart as an entry point to one's own consciousness. The scripture Western and Eastern are full of reference of the wonderful effect to bring one's attention to one's heart. I'd like to share one with you. It's from the Chan Dogya Upanishad. It says, there is a light that shines beyond all things on earth, beyond us all, beyond the heavens, beyond the highest of heavens. That light is in your heart. I do not know how uh, Mr. Arthur Osborne came to the conclusion that it was the actual process to focus on the right hand side of the heart. I must agree with him that knowing what we know now about the scientific discoveries of the benefit of focusing on the heart, I think it's good to do self-inquiry first with the problems that we have. If you're an angry person, and that anger has caused you so many problems. When you are in a state of anger, stop, ask, who is angry? Who's that one? Starting with your problems in your life, questioning if you can solve the problems that you're having with anger, jealousy, lust, might be a very good place to start asking, who is this thinking that? Mr. David Godman is the greatest scholar on the life and teaching of Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharishi, but can he help you achieve or experience enlightenment? He sure can tell you stories for days on end. But is he right on what is to be done to be enlightened, to be awakened, or whatever words you want to use? What's the most surprising to me about David Godman is that knowing the teaching of Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharishi, knowing that the Maharishi never told anyone that this one or that one was enlightened. At one point, David Godman became a disciple of the so-called Papaji. 
When I first met him in 2011, he kept referring to my guru said and my guru told me to write books and I did not know that his guru was the so-called Papaji. Over the years, I've learned a lot about who is that Papaji and what was he teaching in this video of a conversation between Rick Archer and David Godman. David confirmed that Bhagavan never told anyone that this one or that one was enlightened. But he, David Godman, said, sure, Papaji was enlightened. Just listen. So at no point did he ever declare any of his living disciples enlightened and at no point did he ever give any of them permission to go out and teach. Did he declare Papaji enlightened? No. No living person. But you consider Papaji to have been enlightened. So, so you don't so, necessarily need uh, Ramana's imprimatur to you know, actually so, have so, gotten so, right. So what I'm saying is that the lineage doesn't exist simply because it wasn't Ramana, formally Ramana established. never gave any public announcement this person is enlightened and mm -hmm. he definitely didn't say this person has my permission to teach. Right. But if you're going to sort of give uh, gratitude to this, what you consider to be the source of y your knowledge, uh, even if it wasn't officially, you know, uh, condoned, then I guess you're going to say, well, I, I'm really grateful to Papaji and he's really grateful to Ramana, so there's this sort of lin lineage, even though it wasn't um, officially... Li lineage implies authority. This is another way that people tend to uh, persuade people that they've got the right to sit on that chair and tell you how to get enlightened. Mm to say, I am in Ramana's lineage, somehow implies you're in a special state, you've got some permission to be there, some authority to give out teachings, and possibly even some inner state that you can transmit to the people in front of you. Mm. I think this is a fraud. To, to sit in front of an audience with a picture of Ramana behind you and say, I am in the Ramana lineage, is fraud in my opinion. David Godman think it is a fraud for some of the disciple of Papa G to now give satsang with pictures of Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharishi behind them, next to them, making believe that they are in the so-called disciplic succession. And David does not mention that his own guru, Papa G, as you see here, was giving lectures with the pictures of Sri Ramana Maharishi behind him. He also made people believe that somehow he was some chosen disciple of Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharishi. The worst thing that this Papaji may have done was to tell dozens of people what Sri Ramana Maharishi never did. Papaji told dozens of people that they were enlightened and some of them believed it and went to the United States or Europe, started their own business satsang and they were basically selling some cheap form of enlightenment. One of the example is this guy, Andrew Cohen, who was with Papaji at the very beginning of the satsang. He was told he was enlightened and he did some terrible things. There, I will put a link under this video to a list of his crimes thinking that he was enlightened, for example, he told several ladies to go meditate in a frozen lake near his ashram. It was cold, cold water. They were in there trembling, trying to get some type of enlightenment. Yes, some of his disciples called some people so he could beat them up himself. And this asshole still say I'm a spiritual teacher and although there is a list on the internet where you can sign your name so 
that he will not come back and be a so-called spiritual teacher. He is still trying to do a comeback after drinking lots of ayahuasca and so on. And this is because Papa G told them, you are enlightened. Where all those Neo-Advaita Guru are leading their flocks. So I questioned David Godman, what was he thinking when Papa G was telling this one and that one, you are enlightened, you are enlightened. David Godman is the official biographer of the so-called Papa G. Some people that are such devotees of Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharishi do not want to have anything to do with the so-called lineage of the Papaji disaster. One of them wrote me, he says, I don't understand how David Godman could have got so mesmerized that he would have accepted this guy as being an enlightened master. I'm making this video because those 400,000 plus people visiting this video on self-inquiry, many are coming there to learn how to do self-inquiry, how to get closer to enlightenment. That's why I did this video. Whatever David Godman said in that video was in response to questions I was asking him, you see. A few years ago, a journalist asked His Holiness the Dalai Lama, what is the goal of life? And the Dalai Lama said, it's to have a warm heart, full of love, compassion, kindness, gratitude for yourself first and for each and every one that is in your life. If you are only doing the self-inquiry as a mind process, if you're not successful in becoming self-realized that way and you give up the path, what will you have? Now, if for years and years you are working on developing qualities of the heart, love, kindness, uh, gratitude, compassion, it can only grow. It can only bring you closer to self-realization as the ancient scriptures of India says, your true nature is sat shit ananda it's blissful full of wisdom and it's eternal kunjiji's influence on me was profound especially because it came as a corrective to all the strenuous and unsatisfying efforts i'd been making in meditation up to that point but the dangers inherent in his approach soon became obvious the all-or-nothing quality of Punjaji's teaching obliged him to acknowledge the full enlightenment of any person who was grandiose or manic enough to claim it. Thus I repeatedly witnessed fellow students declare their complete and undying freedom, all the while appearing quite ordinary, or worse. In certain cases, these people had clearly had some sort of breakthrough, but Punjaji's insistence upon the finality of every legitimate insight led many of them to delude themselves about their spiritual attainments. Some left India and became gurus, from what I could tell, Punjaji gave everyone his blessing to spread his teachings in this way. He once suggested that I do it, and yet it was clear to me that I was not qualified to be anyone's guru. Nearly twenty years have passed, and I'm still not. Of course, from Punjaji's point of view, this is an illusion. And yet there simply is a difference between a person like myself, who is generally distracted by thought, and one who isn't and cannot be. I don't know where to place Punjaji on this continuum of wisdom. But he appeared to be a lot farther along than his students. Whether Punjaji was capable of seeing the difference between himself and other people, I do not know. But his insistence that no difference existed began to seem either dogmatic or delusional.
On one occasion, events conspired to perfectly illuminate the flaw in Punjaji's teaching. A small group of experienced practitioners, among us several teachers of meditation, had organized a trip to India and Nepal to spend 10 days with Punjaji in Lucknow, followed by 10 days in Kathmandu, to receive teachings on the Tibetan Buddhist practice of Dzogchen. As it happened, during our time in Lucknow, a woman from Switzerland became, quote, enlightened in Punjaji's presence. For the better part of a week, she was celebrated as something akin to the next Buddha. Punjaji repeatedly put her forward as evidence of how fully the truth could be realized without making any effort at all in meditation. And we had the pleasure of seeing this woman sit beside Punjaji on a raised platform, expounding upon how blissful it now was in her corner of the universe. She was, in fact, radiantly happy, and it was by no means clear that Punjaji had made a mistake in recognizing her. She would say things like, There is nothing but consciousness, and there is no difference between it and reality itself. Coming from such a nice, guileless person, there was little reason to doubt the profundity of her experience. When it came time for our group to leave India for Nepal, this woman asked if she could join us. Because she was such good company, we encouraged her to come along. A few of us were also curious to see how her realization would appear in another context. And so it came to pass that a woman whose enlightenment was just confirmed by one of the greatest living exponents of Advaita Vedanta was in the room when we received our first teachings from Tukurgan Rinpoche, who was generally thought to be one of the greatest living Dzogchen masters. Of all the Buddhist teachings, those of Dzogchen most closely resemble the teachings of Advaita. The two traditions seek to provoke the same insight into the non-duality of consciousness. But generally speaking, only Dzogchen makes it absolutely clear that one must practice this insight to the point of stability, and that one can only do so without succumbing to the dualistic striving that haunts most other paths. At a certain point in our discussions with Tuku Organ, our Swiss prodigy declared her boundless freedom in terms similar to those she had used to such great effect with Punjaji. After a few highly amusing exchanges, during which we watched Tuku Urgen struggle to understand what our translator was telling him, he gave a short laugh and looked the woman over with renewed interest. How long has it been since you were last lost in thought, he asked. I haven't had any thoughts for over a week, the woman replied. Tuku Urgen smiled. A week? Yes. No thoughts. No, my mind is completely still. It's just pure consciousness. That's very interesting. Okay. So this is what's going to happen now. We're all just going to sit here and wait for you to have your next thought. There's no hurry. We're all very patient people. We're just going to sit here and wait. Please tell us when you notice a thought arise in your mind. It is difficult to convey what a brilliant and subtle intervention this was. It may have been the most inspired moment of teaching I have ever witnessed. After a few moments, a look of doubt appeared on our friend's face. Okay. Wait a minute. Oh, oh. That could have been a thought there. Okay. Over the next 30 seconds, we watched this woman's enlightenment completely unravel. It became clear that she had been merely thinking about how expansive her experience of consciousness had become, how it was perfectly free of thought, immaculate, just like space, without noticing that she was thinking incessantly. She had been telling herself the story of her enlightenment, and she had been getting away with it because she happened to be an extraordinarily happy person, for whom everything was going very well for the time being. This was the danger of non-dual teachings of the sort that Punjaji was handing out to all comers. It was easy to delude oneself into thinking that one had achieved a permanent breakthrough, especially because he insisted that all breakthroughs must be permanent. What the Dzogchen teachings make clear, however, is that thinking about what is beyond thought is still thinking, and a glimpse of selflessness is generally only the beginning of a process that must reach fruition. Being able to stand perfectly free of the feeling of self is the start of one's spiritual journey, not its end. Thank you very much. Namaste.